Okay, chapter 18. <clears throat> the title of chapter 18 is Reviewing the Sectional Struggle, North versus South. Uh, the idea of popular sovereignty began to uh, gather steam at the time. Um, breaking down that word or the, this phrase, popular sovereignty, pop popular meaning the people, sovereignty meaning power. And the idea was to give the power to the people to decide the slave issue. And when you give the power to the people, that means through their vote. So here's how this was, how this became a thing. Um, you know that the, we just studied about the Treaty of Guadalupe Hildago and how huge that was in the overall scheme of things and bringing on the Civil War. It ended the Mexican-American War, but the debate was raging as to the extension of slavery, to be able to expand or not to be able to extend expand the uh, practice of slavery into the new territory taken over from Mexico from the war. Northerners obviously didn't want slavery to spread and they rallied around Wilmot Proviso, which as I said in the last chapter was able to pass in the house but always get shot down in the Senate because there was an equal number of slave states as free states. Brings back that idea of the South, South desire to always maintain balance between free and slave states. Um, so there was also a statement being made at the time by a few people and, uh, Abraham Lincoln was one of them that talked about it. Um, even though he's not president yet, but he, he said, Hey, if, if ever this country becomes divided along party lines, meaning if, if half the country like the North was one party and the South was another party, say Democrat, and the North say Republican, although they're not around right now, it's the Whig party, then the, the, the union would be in jeopardy because there, there would be a, such a huge divide that it would cause civil war. So that time is coming. Uh, a guy by the name of Lewis Cass, who was a Democrat, is known as the father of popular sovereignty because it was his idea um, to give the power to the people. And uh, you know he's gonna run for president here in 1848 as a Democrat candidate, not gonna win, but he's gonna run for president. But this idea of popular sovereignty seemed to be growing legs. Why? Because it was a compromise and it allowed politicians to put the decision-making power into somebody else's hands other than their own. If, uh, you should be able to see by what's going on in society today that, poli uh, that politicians are always worried about getting reelected. So they tend to stay away, if possible, from really controversial topics because it divides their followers or, you know, and, and could cause them to be voted out. So to be able to say, well, I'm not going to say anything on slavery because the people will decide through popular sovereignty. So politicians really liked it. The people liked it because you're giving them more power. Naturally, oh, you want me to decide? Hey, um, you trust me. You're giving me that power. So it was really growing um, during this time, the idea of popular sovereignty. And it's, it's a big part of the election of 1848, where the Democrats nominate the father of popular sovereignty, Lewis Cass. So obviously, he's going to throw it in the hands of the people and say, hey, you decide who about slavery. Well, the Whigs nominate Zachary Taylor. Yes, former war hero, Zachary Taylor, the hero of, of, the, of one of the many of the battles of the Mexican War, but he was the one that was sent to the disputed area. So Zachary Taylor was well known at the time, and he chose to ignore all the issues. Uh, also important that you know that Zachary Taylor was from Virginia, and Virginians, especially high-end Virginians who make a lot of money, usually are plantation owners, and Zachary Taylor was, and he did own slaves. So he is a Southern slave owner. Um, he had never, ever believe this or not, believe it or not, he had never held office or even voted before. The first time this man votes is for himself in the election of 1848. Uh, so yeah, there, there you go. There's a, a little insight into Zachary Taylor, slave owner from Virginia, never voted, never held office, and this guy's running for president. Uh, because many of the uh, anti-slavery people, whether it was through humanitarian reasons 
or whether it was financial reasons, not wanting slavery to spread because, you know, like, because of the uh, people's um, salaries would go down because they'd have to compete with slave labor. There was a group that was formed called the Free Soil Party. Um, there was frustration because there was no anti-slavery party. So thus the creation of the Free Soil Party. They are committed against the extension of slavery into the territories. They don't believe in popular sovereignty. Um, they, m most of these members of the Free Soil Party, it was a financial thing. That, but there were a lot of people, though, too, but not a majority, that were for humanitarian reasons. They get immediate legitimacy by picking a former president and Martin Van Buren as their running mate, as their running, uh, as their candidate, sorry. So Martin Van Buren, MVB, remember he's the one who took over for Jackson. So everybody knew who Martin Van Buren was. So uh, as I said, gives him some legitimacy there. However, in the end, uh, Zachary Taylor, who never voted, never held office, now is going to become president because of the circumstances. And uh, the Whigs are going to win this uh, election. And uh, Zachary Taylor becomes president and he is going to die. He's going to become the second president to die from illness in the office um, behind um, Harrison. Harrison lasted 29 days. This guy lasted over two years. But uh, yeah, Zachary Taylor was one of six presidents born in a log cabin and he was one of seven presidents from Virginia. So yeah. Let's talk, we'll talk about his death in a minute, but let's get into what happened during his presidency when he was alive. And it was huge in the overall scheme of things, not only for the state of California that we live in, but also for the union, because it's gonna lead directly to the breakup of the union and civil war that starts in 1861. In 1848, gold was discovered in California and uh, it became a thing in 1849. So that's why you get the San Francisco 49ers it's from 1849, gold rush. People rushed to California in 49, and that's why they're called 49ers. But uh, gold was discovered near Sacramento, and at first it was, they tried to keep it secret, and they did for a little while, but that wasn't going to last long. When people found out that there was gold in California, you had people come from all over. They came from the East Coast. They came from the Midwest. They came from other countries. They came from Asian countries. They come from European countries, all to try to strike it rich a very, very small percentage of people, very small, infinitesimal amount of people struck it rich from mining for gold. Others came, opened up businesses, laundry mats, restaurants, what have you, they, the supply stores. They were able to strike it rich that way, not necessarily by uh, finding gold. But because of the influx of so many people worldwide, not only nationwide, but worldwide, that came to California. California had enough people to apply for statehood. But then another problem is going to emerge. And the problem is, at the time, and so I'm showing you some pictures here, of gold rush and mining. At the time, there were 15 free states and 15 slave states. California would represent the 31st state. Now, at the time, there was no other territory ready to become a state. It's not like they could do a Missouri compromise type thing and carve out a state from another state. They didn't have that luxury this time like they did in 1820. Um, there was talk briefly of splitting California into two and making one Northern California a state and Southern California a state. But that wouldn't have, that by breaking up the state, it would not uh, the, there wouldn't be enough people in either one of the north or south to uh, that would be able to, to so they wouldn't be able to become a state. There wouldn't be enough people. Anyway, so there was debate about what they should do um, with California. No matter what, it was going to throw the balance off. So they're going to throw this thing into the Senate, and the, there's four men who are going to argue in the Senate. Four senators. And uh, they're all pretty well-known senators, too. Some of the greatest debate in Senate history occurred over the California issue. Um, you had the, someone like John C. Calhoun from South Carolina, and you know about John C. Calhoun and all that went down with Jackson. And, you know, at this time, he's pretty old. Um, he's going to die shortly after this. 
He argued that the South should get more representation in the House and there should be two presidents, one from the North and one from the South. So let's break that down a little bit. First of all, you know that representation in the House is dependent solely on, on uh, population. And the South, plain and simple, didn't have as many people as the North. So why would they throw more representation to the South? And then the second thing, having two presidents, one from the North and one from the South, I'm not sure that's a good idea. Bottom line is, in John C. Calhoun's argument, there is absolutely no give and take. There's no compromise there. And then you have someone like uh, William Seward. Let's jump down to William Seward, who was from New York, who said he was a Christian, and he said it's God's will that there should be no slavery in the territories. He's called he's called it higher law, higher law, meaning God's law. God would not want slavery to extend in the territory. So whatever, you know, you don't have any, any compromise in what William Seward is saying either. And then Daniel Webster comes forward with his 7th of March speech, and he argued for compromise. Everybody was fired up to hear Daniel Webster speak because he's the greatest speaker in Senate history, and they said, all right, he's going to He's going to seal the deal here. He's going to be the one that's going to come out against slavery in the territories, and then everybody's going to listen to him because he's so um, revered in, in the Senate. And he came out in the 7th of March speech, and he argued for compromise. He became what they called a fallen angel to many Northerners because they were disappointed. But this speech is what you know, puts off the Civil War um, because it was Henry Clay who heard the word compromise, and you know Henry Clay, he's known as the great compromiser in history. Someone said compromise and Henry Clay came running. So he's, uh, it just, just to remind you, Henry Clay was the author of the Missouri Compromise in 1820, and then the Compromise of 1833 that gradually reduced the tariff over an eight year period by 10%. And he helped stave off civil war on those two occasions, and he's gonna do it one more time. His argument is going to become law, and it's going to become known as the Compromise of 1850, and here it is. Clay, in his Senate speech, although he is also very old at this time and couldn't give his speech because he was sick in bed and eventually would die shortly after, he said California should be admitted as a free state in this compromise. Well, the South didn't like that. The North liked it. Um, but then he's going to throw some things to the South that they wanted, like for one, the Utah-New Mexico territory, they would divide up that, the rest of the territory, one from Mexico into two territories, and they would, the slavery would be decided by popular sovereignty there. There's that phrase again. Um, so, uh, you know, they're gonna, people are gonna vote on it. Outlawed slave trade in DC, because he said this is the nation's capital, there should be no auctions or slave trade in DC. However, for slavery would still be legal in DC. So something for the South there. And then the last thing that the South desperately wanted was a stricter fugitive slave law. Many of the slaves from the South were escaping and all they had to do was go to the North. Once they got across the Mason-Dixon line and got into the free, free state, free state of say Pennsylvania, then they would be free and they can live their rest of their lives uh, lives up in the north and the south was frustrated by that they said that's their property and it should be the law that that uh, no matter where you're from north or south your obligation to um, you know make sure that you get that slave back to its rightful owner so that's called a, a fugitive slave law so they're promoting stricter fugitive slave laws and that became part of clay's compromise of 1850 and something that the south wanted so in breaking this thing down the north got what they wanted california admitted it as a slave state it's the 31st state and now you have 16 free states and 15 slave states so you had to offer the south something that they desperately wanted a stricter fugitive slave law so they went and they traded on that one and became a compromise so that's how the uh, clay's compromise of 1850 uh, was passed, or else there's no way it would have passed. The other thing, Zachary Taylor, President Zachary Taylor, was against this compromise because he was from the South in Virginia and he didn't think it was acceptable. And he knew that at any time they could outlaw slavery by passing a law. And, and so he was going to veto 
these five bills, but then he dies in office. He died, and then his, the, the vice president at the time was Miller Fillmore. He takes over, and he was the one that signed those bills into law. As it turns out, the most controversial part of the Compromise of 1850 was not what everybody would think it would be, is now you had 31 states and 16 free states and 15 slave states, and now they can overturn the slavery and make it illegal right then and there. They could have done it, um, but they didn't because they knew it would mean civil war. The most controversial part of it was the stricter fugitive slave laws. There's a lot of controversy over that. And most people in the south, uh, North were appalled by the fact that it was the, that they could be put in jail if they didn't return a runaway slave or, or alert the authorities to come and get a runaway slave. Um, they didn't like that. And no, many Northern states passed what's called personal liberty laws that said they don't have to do that. So a lot of controversy, North and South, um, leading to the Civil War here. The other thing about it is Harriet Beecher Stowe, um, wrote Uncle Tom's Cabin because she was so appalled by fugitive slave laws. And Uncle Tom's Cabin, as I've said before, you know, is the, you know, quite possibly the uh, most important book ever written um, next to the Bible. So, all right. The death, just real fast here, the death of uh, President Taylor. And on Independence Day, 1850, President Zachary Taylor stood hatless in the sun for hours, listening to long-winded speeches. He returned to the White House and attempted to cool off by eating cherries, cucumbers, and drinking iced milk. Oof. Severe stomach cramps followed, and it is likely that Taylor's own physicians inadvertently killed him with a whole series of debilitating treatments. So, looks like a medical mistake here. He probably had a little sunstroke, and uh, they tried all kinds of medical procedures, and it eventually killed him. Do I think it was on purpose? No, I've never read anything that said it was on purpose, but... Zachary Taylor dies, Miller Fillmore becomes president. Um, yeah, we'll talk, uh, talk in a little while here when we come back to class about uh, slavery in California. There actually was slavery in California, not very many, but some Southerners came from the South and brought their slaves with them. So there was a push to make California a slave state by Southerners too, but obviously that didn't work talked about Clay's compromise. And the last thing I want to look at here in part one would be the map as of 1850. So if you were to count this out, there'd be uh, 16 free states and 15 slave states. And you see over here in the Utah, New Mexico territory, this was all the territory here that I'm circling that was won uh, in the Mexican War. California became a free state. This territory right here, was these two were divided into two territories, Utah, New Mexico, and they'd be decided by popular sovereignty. The war is going to start before they ever vote on anything like that. But that's how the U.S. looked after uh, the Compromise of 1850.